Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy, and the book that I am going to be reading the first chapter of today is called The Cricket War, and it is by Ta Fem and Sandra McTavish. This book is based on true events, events that actually happened to Ta, and it is the story of a boy named Ta in the book who lives in Vietnam in the early 80s, and he is going to be sent from his country by himself to hopefully go to America or to go somewhere to get out of Vietnam. Ta's parents are concerned that he will become conscripted for the armed services when he comes of age. They send his older brother Vu ahead of him and so now it is his turn and he embarks on this journey all by himself. He's 12 years old and it is a harrowing journey across the South China Seas in various boats. There are a number of reasons why he has to switch what vessel he's on. Survival is not guaranteed. He's with people he doesn't know, and he's hopefully going to meet an uncle in America whose number is sewn into his shirt. It's amazing when you're reading this book to realize that this really happened to the author, and not only to the author, but to a large number of Vietnamese people at the time. They were known as Vietnamese boat people, and many of them were Ta's age or younger embarking on this trip by themselves. I don't want to give you a lot of details about what happens on the trip because that is a large part of the story. And so I'll just leave you with that brief description. I'll now read part of the first chapter of this book. It's actually very long, so I'm going to read the first segment of the first chapter. Chapter one, Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, April, 1980. Mine's going to bite the leg off yours, Ta. Lum smiles devilishly, rubbing his hands with glee. That's what you said before the last fight, I laugh, not at all phased by the threat. And remember how it turned out? Lum rolls his eyes. The last fight had not gone his way. I add, I believe I've won the last four fights. No, the last five fights. That'll make this one number six. If you win, interrupts Lum. When I win. Okay, Ta, let's get started. We are sitting in the doorway of my house. We've each chosen a cricket for the duel. Lum, who lives next door, has brought his insects in a matchbox, which he carefully holds in the palms of his hand. His black cricket chirps and nibbles on a piece of banana leaf Lum has given him, unaware that he's about to go into battle. All the boys we know like cricket fighting, but Lum takes it more seriously than most. Although he spends more time training his crickets than I do, they rarely win. That's why he doesn't have nearly as many as I have. I use a cardboard box to make a housing complex for my crickets. I separate the insects in walled cardboard compartments with a screen covering the top of the box so they can get air but won't escape. I feed them pieces of banana, lettuce, and grass and train them to act aggressively by taunting them with a dead cricket's head mounted on the end of a toothpick. Lum and I have always lived next door to each other. We're both 11 years old and have been best friends for as long as I can remember. We're opposites and that's why we get along so well. I'm the shortest in the class and he's the tallest. Lum is a jokester who doesn't pay attention in school. The only things he's serious about are cricket fighting, which he never wins, and soccer, which he's amazing at. I'm quieter and do well in school and some of the things my mother wishes that I didn't do well in, like cricket fighting. Each day after school, we either play soccer or fight crickets. Lum doesn't usually complain when his crickets lose to mine, and I never grumble when he scores on me in soccer. With cricket fighting, the rules never change. The winner gains the loser's cricket, and if the losing cricket dies in battle, as sometimes happens, the loser gives the winner another of his crickets. Resting between Lum and me sits a small box in which the war will take place. I examine my crickets and select my prized fighter from my collection and put him in the small box. Then Lum carefully takes his cricket out of his matchbox. While he takes his time placing it in the box next to mine, I pluck a hair out of my head that I plan to dangle in front of the insects, tickling them in an attempt to aggravate them and make them want to fight. Instead of using the hair to provide the crickets, I reach over and tickle Lum's cheek. This startles him, and he drops his cricket into the box. Hey! But he doesn't have time to get mad as the two crickets puff their wings and chirp frantically. Then Lums hops towards mine and bites him. Mine bites right back, harder and more vicious. Bite, bite, chirp, chirp. The insects lock their bodies in a feisty embrace. Suddenly, 30 seconds into the fight, 
Lum's cricket flees from my champion and seeks protection in the corner of the box. My cricket flutters his wings and chirps a victorious cry. Yes, I punch my fists into the air. What did I tell you? That's six in a row. I quickly retrieve the crickets, placing them one at a time in separate stalls in my cardboard complex, rewarding each of them with a piece of lettuce. You cheated, Lum whines. My cricket wasn't ready when I dropped him into the box. Lum looks disappointed as he picks up his empty matchbox. I'm running out of crickets. I'm going to have to buy some more at this rate. I'm running out of room in my cardboard box. I'm going to have to make another box at this rate, I tease. Lum gives me a friendly slug. I'd better head home, Ta. My mother will have dinner ready. Mine too. Do you want to have another cricket battle on Monday? Let's play soccer instead. I need to stock up and train some crickets before we have another battle. I could always sell you one of my crickets. I've got so many. I joke as I pick up my cardboard box. Have a good weekend, I add before entering my house. My front door opens into a living room with only a three-seater couch and a matching chair. My brother Vu and two sisters To and Teen are sitting on the couch talking about typical teenager things that don't interest me. They ignore me as I crouch down and place my box of crickets in the corner. My mother will make me move it at bedtime because the sound of the crickets chirping drives her crazy when she tries to sleep. As I stand up, Vu looks over at me. How'd you do? Vu asks. I won. That's great. That's five in a row, isn't it? No, it's six, I boast. Since you keep winning, Lum must almost be out of crickets. He's definitely getting low. I told him he could buy some from me if he wanted. We both laugh. Stretched along the far wall is a narrow staircase leading up to a small room that I've only visited a handful of times. This is my father's room. My mother calls it his escape and lets us kids know that we're not allowed up there under any condition without his permission. The first time my father invited me to his room, I was so excited. I thought it had treasures or gold or something special, but I was completely disappointed. The room only has a desk and chair, a radio, some books, and a sleeping mat for my father. I leave my siblings in the living room and walk into the dining room. Our dining room used to have a table and chairs. After the communists captured Saigon and all of South Vietnam in the spring of 1975, my father lost his well-paying job at the bank. Although my mother didn't work beforehand, after that she and my father both got jobs, but they didn't make nearly enough. To make ends meet, they started selling household items, including the dining room furniture. Now the room remains empty, at night, the dining room transforms into a bedroom where I sleep beside my mother, my brother, and two sisters on mats on the cool ceramic floor. Past the dining room is a tiny open courtyard. On one side of the courtyard is the washroom. A large tank on top of the washroom collects rainwater from the roof. If there hasn't been any rain for a while, we get water from our neighbor's well and carry it home in buckets, one bucket in each hand. Beyond the washroom is the kitchen. Delicious smells drift from the clay stove in the kitchen where my mother has been cooking dinner. You're almost late, she says, handing me a pair of chopsticks and a bowl of rice and pork chops with lemongrass. I bow my head and sheepishly join her with the rest of the family to eat. After dinner, I sit on the couch to work on my math homework. I tap my pencil against my notebook while trying to solve a problem. I remember learning this, Boo says. I jump and then sigh. I hadn't noticed him standing over me. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. I give him a puzzled look. Here, I'll show you the formula to solve it. He sits beside me, takes the notebook and pencils, and gives me a mini math lesson. Thanks, I say. No problem. It's easy if you stop to think about it. Vu teases, ruffling my hair. I shake my head quickly to get my hair back in place. Vu is right. I usually learn quickly when I pay attention. On Monday morning, as is the case every morning, church bells wake me. I lie in bed with my eyes closed and listen to them for a minute before I get up. I don't want to rise yet. I sleep next to Vu, who often battles nightmares. His tossing and turning woke me in the night. I drag myself out of bed, rolling up my sleeping mat, fold my blanket, wash, put on my school uniform, navy pants and a white shirt, eat my breakfast of steamed yam, and go out to meet Lum. Every school morning, Lum meets me on the street outside my front door. As I wait for my best friend, the fat yellow sun pokes above the gray houses. Its warm rays cast a long shadow over the rooftops, creating a perfect shade for me. At least it's still the dry season for a few more weeks, so I don't have to worry about standing in the rain. Friends and neighbors walk past and we say hello. A couple of stray dogs stroll by, sniffing the ground and ignoring me. Down the street, a cat meows. 
The dogs jerk their head up. They start barking and chase the cat. Tom's baby is crying again. On quiet nights, I can hear his wail through our common wall. My neighbor Sang's pigs make a lot of noise when they are hungry. Their grunts are so loud that I know they haven't been fed yet. After 10 minutes, I'm tired of waiting. I call Lum's name, knowing he can hear me from inside his house. He doesn't answer. The door is shut. I knock. Again, no answer. Lum's home is smaller than mine, so I know someone inside could hear me if anyone was home. Lum is usually the last person to leave in the morning. His parents go to work early, and his older brother, An, and sister, Mai, start work before us. It's not unusual that they're not home. But it's strange that Lum isn't here. He would normally tell me if he couldn't walk to school with me. Perhaps Lum wanted help with his homework so he could pass the math test tomorrow and left early. I don't have time to wander around the neighborhood looking for him. If I don't get to school soon, I'll be late. That's the end of the first part of chapter one. There's more of the chapter left. I just wanted to read part of it. There's some really great notes in the back of this book. There is a note from Sandra McTavish talking about how this story came to be and the differences between this book and the author Taz's real experience. There are not that many differences. We're getting an account of someone who really went through something like this or very similar to this. There's also a really great note that has a brief recent history of Vietnam, which is helpful to read. You could even read it before the book. It really explains the situation that Ta and his family are in and other families and why these young boys and whole families are leaving Vietnam at this time. It's a very quick read. It's difficult to put down because of the journey that Ta goes on and the danger that he is in. The book does a great job of really helping you to understand how frightening that must have been and what an unusual and difficult experience Ta and other kids like him went through. But as you can see from the little bit that I read, you also get a really good sense of his life in Vietnam, how he had these friends and this family, and it wasn't really a life that he wanted to leave at all. The other thing about Ta in this book is his ability to continue to connect with people. And that's another part of the story that I really enjoyed. He just meets people along the way who help him, who he connects with and he helps in some way. And that adds an element of hope to the book in general. I learned a lot reading this book about Ta's experience and the experience of other Vietnamese boat people. And I also just really enjoyed the story of this character. I recommend that you read The Cricket War by Ta Pham and Sandra McTavish. Thank you for joining me.